evening. So you should all know that I had an incredible speech planned. I had it memorized, I had it down. Um, and then Tuesday happened. Um, <laughs> and, and after I was able to pick myself off of the floor and stop screaming, this probably around Thursday, um, I realized that everything that I had memorized that I thought was so amazing was just no longer relevant. Um, so I'm saying, and, and, and actually at the, at the time I remember thinking, I, I honestly remember thinking on Thursday saying, I can't, I can't come. I just, I don't have anything to say. But then I thought there might be Jalaf. And so I changed my mind. I said, you know, I'll come. And, and that's all to say that I wrote this last night. And so I know it's against Ted, like I should have had it mem memorized. I should have had all my hand motions. And so I'm just going to ask you, I'm going to talk like we're here with friends. We're here with family. Um, but I have my little prop here because I wrote this in a fury last night. So I, I might look down, but I'm going to keep eye contact. I'll try. Um, so anyway, I have a favorite question. This is a question that I usually ask at parties or if I'm giving interviews. Um, and it sounds like a comedic question, but essentially the question is, what would you do as a job after the revolution? Sometimes I say zombie apocalypse. The event itself is not really important. The point is the aftermath. What would you do when the foundations of your society, when the world as you know it, go away? Now, again, it sounds like a joke, but I think it actually can tell you something profound. So I'm going to pick on people. Adobe, what would you do? Children. She would have all the children over. I'm going to ask Equia, what would you do? You'd be a healer. So, this means, so there's no skyscrapers, there's no computers, there's no internet. You can't be something like a digital strategist, whatever that is, um, because you have to be something that you can barter for food or for protection, right? And the reason I ask that question is because I think it tells you something very profound about who you are, about what you value, about the service that you want to give. Because the thing about being a community, the thing about being a community where you don't have all the distractions that you have of modern day life, is that existence really is stripped down to its essentials, right? The point of the question also is to discover, right? Your value in such a community is linked directly to what you can give. My standard answer has always been, without question, when people say, well, what would you be? A midwife. So why would I be a midwife? So first of all, I love babies. I'm a mother of four. Um, I also love pregnant women. I think that they are an incredible blend of the sacred and the profane. I love giving unsolicited advice about <laughs> what to eat, what to wear, what kind of medicine to take. And like I said, I love pregnant ladies. They're, again, like I said, it's a combination of this incredibly miraculous thing you are actually creating life. You are housing soul, in my case, souls, twins, woot, respect. You're housing people, but at the same time, you're kind of disgusting. You're waddling around. You're full of gas, so much gas. <laughs> but, the, so, but so to me, the ability to be able, so in this world, in this tribe, to be able to give back in that way seems like a really incredible thing. It's something that I would love. So going back to zombie apocalypses, in case you missed it, uh, America has just elected a man whose entire candidacy, entire platform, has been explicitly grounded in racism, homophobia, xenophobia, religious intolerance, and promises that he will completely abandon and dismantle rule of law and civil liberties. So I think what's interesting, particularly in this group, is that many of us are people who've lived through the cruel reigns of small and greedy men laughed. I had friends who laughed and said, ha ha, at last, America, you will understand what it's like to be from my country. You will understand what it's like to be ruled in tyranny. But for those of us who either do now or have ever called the US home, the shock and the terror is overwhelming. The US is no longer this shining city on the hill. Of course, those of us who are woke know that it wasn't necessarily ever that. But now Yates' The Second Coming seems incredibly apt. 
things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. So this, since Tuesday, I've been thinking a lot about the concept of safety and about the fact that empirically, given what we know about humans, given what we know about history, given what we know about everything, is that nowhere actually ever is a safe place. I'm saying that not to be dramatic or depressing, but it's a very obvious lesson amongst many others that I took from Tuesday. There's no safe country for apathy. There's no safe country for disengagement. Earlier this year, when I asked my zombie question, because I actually ask it a lot, I'd sometimes replace if Trump wins with zombie apocalypse, because I thought both of them were both equally hilariously improbable. <laughs> but here we are. One of the things that has struck me as someone who works in policy and engages directly with both government and civil society, particularly across the continent, is the extent to which contempt for government, for politicians, and for governmental institutions is so widespread. And in so many cases, of course, it's absolutely well-earned. At the same time, that general contempt coexists with waves of fervent hope, right? Like in one candidate who is expected to have messianic properties, who will single-handedly root out corruption, smite our enemies, somebody to rescue us, a savior. And of course, the obvious point is that when we say or when we believe that only fools or rogues are in government, we make it so. And when we expect men, we expect mere men to be gods, we engineer our own fall. So going back to the question of what you would do, this is a particularly interesting question alluded to earlier in this group. We all know that for most of us, as children of African parents, there are really only two, maybe three acceptable answers. What are acceptable careers? Let's hear them, we all know them. Yes. Anything not on that list, disgrace to family. So many of us chose our careers in service to those expectations, right? With those ex while those expectations and our service to them was often new rooted in a concept of giving back, I mean, in the sense of your parents saying, and I'm going to use a generic African parent, did I sacrifice, send you to Unilag, send you to Harvard for you to be a DJ? <laughs> I mean, no. But see, that, that notion of, of career change is often rooted in a very narrow concept of giving back, and it's often connected to a very specific notion of prestige. I think it's imperative, no, urgent, that we think in terms of service. How can each of us live a life of service, in service to our larger communities, in service to our countries, however and wherever we define them? Across the continent here in the, U in the UK, US, where Government is defined as a far-off entity. That's one of the things I've, re I've noticed. As in, what is government doing or not doing to us or for us or at us? And this obviously makes perfect sense if only fools and rogues are in governments, because we know we are not fools. We are not rogues. But when there's no safe space, when there's no savior, when there's no one coming to rescue us, what then? I don't necessarily think that everyone should run for office, but I do think that so many more of us should. We can't all be president, but there are so many ways to serve. I have been incredibly inspired by Chikwe, who has recently entered government as the head of Nigeria's Center for Disease Control. I know that his path will be difficult, but I think all of us here have a responsibility to find a specific, tangible piece of work and do it. We also have a responsibility to find people like Chikwe who are doing the work, who are kind, who are brave and hardworking, and raise them up. At Facebook, we have dozens of posters on the wall with all sorts of internal memes. So these are things that employees have come up with that have become sort of internal gospel. One of my favorites is, nothing at Facebook is somebody else's problem. It's not terribly profound, but as a way to live, it's a clear challenge to not to walk by, to own a problem, dedicate yourself to the solution. If that problem is governance, then how are you, how are we, making it our problem? So back to my answer to my own question. I said, after the revolution, I want to be a midwife. When I think about what being a midwife means, apart from being part of ushering life into the world, apart from being a part of welcoming uh, another woman into the sisterhood of motherhood, 
I think about how midwives have also always been considered. They've been considered witches, right? Wise women, subversive women, nasty women. Midwife translates into with women. These were women who are often threatening to a patriarchal system. So what do I want to be? I want to be a threat. I want to be a threat to misogyny. I want to be a threat to greed. I want to be a threat to a worldview that sees women as inferior. I want to be a threat to governments that see people of color as targets. I want to be a threat to a system of laws that denigrates and identifies people as unworthy if they identify as LGBTQ. I want to be a threat to a system of government that sees immigrants and Muslims as disposable. I want to give birth to a movement where love and not hate wins. So the revolution is now. It has always been now. There is no safe space. There has never been a space that makes it safe for any of us to be apathetic or disengaged or to hide behind cynicism. This is both terrifying and also energizing because it means that we, each of us here today, are the ones we've been waiting for. So back to my first question, what will you do after the revolution? Thank you.